Here we go. In 1 Samuel 23, I'm going to read some verses and then we're going to say a word of prayer thanking the Lord for his grace. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 1. 1 Samuel 23, 1. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought against the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. And it came to pass when Abathar the son of Ahimelech fled to David to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. Now an ephod, is, that was the, the, the uh, instrument of the, the priest, okay, to, to contact God. Verse 7, and it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war, to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abathar the priest, bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Lastly, verse 11 and 12. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant have heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Verse 12 to end. Then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly father, we do stop right now to give you thanks and praise <clears throat> for your holy word. Your holy word made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ for his sacrifice on Calvary's cross for our sins, how he shed his precious, innocent blood to pay for all that was wrong with us, Father. We thank you for your word uh, in the Holy Scriptures, the, the written word of God, that, 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 uh, that living word of God that's quick and powerful. As we look into your word today, Father, we ask that you give us great insight, understanding, and wisdom. And most importantly, we ask that you give us a greater appreciation of your Son, the blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, the reason we started off in this, in this passage here in 1 Samuel is because I want to show you a principle that's at work in Scripture that not too many people either know about or talk about or learn about. And I'm going to say most preachers and pastors don't even think about this. But when you're a Bible student and you're studying out a topic, you have to take into account the overall um, uh, narrative, how the Bible uh, presents something. Our study today is called the altar of the cross. And again, this was a question I got a couple of weeks ago. Because someone says, we can see a pattern that there's this altar that God wants people to sacrifice on. But if the ultimate sacrifice is the Lord Jesus Christ, why was it on a cruel and criminal Roman cross and not on an altar? And that's a great question. Because you can see all through scripture that God has the sacrifice on that altar. Hold your hand right here. Go with me over to back to Leviticus. Go to Leviticus chapter 17. Real quick. Leviticus chapter 17. I want to show you a principle in scripture. Leviticus chapter 17. While you're going there, I'm going to, to, just, I'm going to, to say something about blood. When Adam and Eve were created by Almighty God, and, and, and God married them in holy matrimony, Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But there are other times in scripture where the Bible, as Paul says, when he got saved, he says, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. When the, when the disciples of Jesus Christ, our Lord, saw him after his resurrection, he says, they thought it was a spirit. And, and he says, a spirit have not flesh and bone as you see me have. 
Now, why did Adam say bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh? Why didn't he say bone of my bone or of flesh of my flesh and blood of my blood? Because what happened was when, when Adam and Eve were created in God's image and his likeness, they bared his glory. And that glory was before mankind even had blood. Because the life of Adam and Eve was the spirit of Almighty God. And when Adam looked at it, he didn't say, he didn't say flesh and blood. He says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. The same type of body or consistency that the Lord himself had after his resurrection. So where did blood come from? When Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, and God says, thou shalt surely die. Somebody asked me, says, Brother Ron, when God says, thou shalt surely die, but they didn't die till hundreds of years later, what was that? I said, when they ate of that fruit, and they looked at themselves, and the glory of God disappeared, and they were naked. That's when the tainted blood of humanity came through. And every human being from that point on was born with that tainted blood. Cain, Abel, and all of us. And I'm going to show you why God allowed that blood. Look at Leviticus 17, verse 11. Because after the fall of man, blood became the life of man, not the spirit of God. Because they lost that because of their disunbelief. Look at verse 11, Leviticus 17. For the life of the flesh is in the what? What gives our flesh life? I can tell you, you can sit right here. You can have a nurse come in, a blood bank, and they can keep taking your blood out, and eventually you're going to pass out, and eventually you're going to die. In fact, blood is given to others to live. I have O, what's my, what's my blood type? O negative. I am a universal blood donor. My blood can help everybody else. The problem you won't get it because I hate needles. If I didn't, that's the only problem. I, I don't give blood because I don't like needles. But if I didn't mind the needles, I could just give blood all the time because I know my blood can go to, you, you have these terrorist attacks and massacres, people lose blood. The blood banks are supplying blood so that people can live because the life of the flesh is where? Look at that verse again, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Why did God give blood? And I have given it to you upon the what? Altar. We're going to see where this altar comes from. God has given it to man, to, to Israel in this one. But I have given it to you upon the altar. And what was that blood on the altar to do? To make atonement for your what? Souls. Well, why, does you have, why do you have to make atonement for your soul? Because when Adam and Eve sinned, they brought sin and death in the world, right? And, and that death separated man's soul from Almighty God. And so now God has a prescription, an ordinance, to make you right with him. And so when Adam and Eve were kicked out and God put the cherubim there, where the cherubim is, it's, it's the presence of God. His cherubims cover him. So when Cain and Abel, for example, came, and, and Cain says, I'm going to take the best fruits I have, and I'm going to give them to God. And God says, that's not what I want. His brother Abel brings of a flock, his, the, 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 the lamb, the fatling, and, and he was going to sacrifice that there. God says, I'm pleased with you, Abel, because that's what I want. Shed blood. But you, Cain, I don't care how good that is, that fruit of the cursed ground, it's not right. Why? Because notice what God says here, verse 11 again. And I have given you the blood upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. At the end of verse 11, for it is the what? The blood. Now, this is important because when in the end of this study, we're going to see that Satan hates the blood of Jesus Christ. And he'll use it and take it out of other versions of the Bible. Colossians 1.14 in your NIV. Because he hates the innocent blood of Christ because there's power there to bring life, eternal life. Now, look at this. For it is the blood that make an atonement for the souls. Now go back to 1 Samuel. Here's what I want you to see. We're going to see a couple of things here as I talk about this study today. There's two things I want to show you. <clears throat> look at verses, uh, 1 Samuel 23, look at verse number 11 and 12. Let's, let's focus on those passages for a second. David is down here. He wants to fight against the Philistines. God says, I'll deliver you. I'll deliver the Philistines in your hand. But David wants to go down to the city called Keilah. He says, now, if Saul hears that I'm there, Lord, Saul is now trying to destroy David out of jealousy because he's going to be replaced by David. 
And, and, and David calls the, the priest with the ephod, the way they connect with Almighty God. And he says, if Saul come down, let's look at it. Verse 11. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? That was the first question. Will Saul come down as thy servant that heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. Now everybody focus on verse 11. And the Lord said what? He might come down. No, he, he might come down. No, he might. He will come down. Now, he will come down. That's what God said. Does the, what, does the Lord lie? No, nope. God who cannot lie. Does God know the future? Yes, he does. He will come down. We were talking about Calvinists earlier. According to a Calvinist, the sovereign will of God, if God makes that type of definitive statement, that's not a wishy-washy, he will come down. That means you can write, you can, you can book it in the book, check mark, boom. I, I do my check marks back, as you told me. Okay, everybody else do this way. I do it this way. There you go. But he will come down, but that's not all. Look at the next verse. Verse 12. Then said David, so when Saul gets there, what will the men do? Will they fight for me, Lord? No. Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, what? They might deliver thee up. They will. They will deliver thee up. There's no hesitation by God. They will deliver the up. Now, if God's will is so, is so sovereign and that everything he says will happen, we have a problem. We have a problem. Because look at the next verse. Look at verse 13. Then David and his men, which are about 600, they stayed there because it was de declared by God that Saul will come and be delivered. They stayed there. They said, fatalism is true. Let's just stay here and get delivered. Is that what it says? What did they do? They arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbore to go forth. Now, look at verse 13. David did not have this fatalism that like Islam has, you know, Allah, Allah's will be done and all this stuff. No, 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 no. Or like a Calvinist, if God, if God says it's going to happen, hey, it's just going to happen, nothing we can do about it. David understood that God gave man something called free will. Our, our Facebook Live, somebody asked me about that, we're going to look at that, or human volition. And although God made a definitive declaration, Saul will come down, David, and they will deliver thee up, David, because David has free will. David says, hey, guys, I believe God. Let's get out of here. And look what happened. Verse 13. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah. David didn't stay there. David didn't say, hey, man, God said he's coming down. They're going to deliver up. Let's just go. David said, man, we got to get out of here. He arose. He departed out of Keilah, verse 13, and went whithersoever they could go. They didn't know where they were going. They were like, we got to get out of here. They were like, we got to find another spot. But look at the end of verse 13. And it was told Saul that David was escaped of Keilah. And Saul says, I must go because the, the Lord says that I will come down, so I'm going to go. Uh -uh. Look what it said. And he forbear to go forth. Saul heard that David chose to leave. And Saul said, what's the sense of going? David's gone. And the reason I bring this up, because the Bible has a principle we've got to look at about the altar of the cross. And that principle has to do with multiple alternatives or possibilities. Now, keep, stay with me. This is important. Okay? In the Bible, it's a principle called multiple alternatives. Or possibilities. God is so powerful as the Almighty that He can He'll still do what He wants to do and give you the free will to make decisions. Free will to choose and to make decisions. <clears throat> Here's the point. We're gonna see that the altar of the cross 
this principle of <clears throat> multiple alternatives and possibilities is at work here. And I'm going I'm to show you from Scripture. The Lord wasn't lying when he says Saul's coming down, nor was he lying when he says the men will deliver you. But because of free will, David chose to move. And so what God said did not happen. It didn't mean God was lying. It didn't mean. But, but what we're going to see is God can tell you what's going to happen in Scripture. He'll give you multiple viewpoints and let you decide which one. I'm sure it's going to be so clear. Watch this. What we will see is that just like with David and Saul, man's free will volition is always the determining factor in God's dealing with man. Let me say that again. Just like with David and Saul's situation for 1 Samuel, that's why I started there, we're going to see that everything in humanity, if God's dealing with man, is, is based upon man's free will as he deals with God. I'll give you an example of that. <clears throat> oh, here's a question. Why did God show both possibilities? Why didn't God do this? I ask questions like this. When, when David asked the priest with the ephod, will Saul come down? Why didn't God say, nah, David, I'm looking down through time. He's not going to come down because you, before that, you're going to choose to not stay there. So why didn't God go through that whole big thing? Because whatever happens, God's okay with it. But also, God wants you to know that this book... The Holy Bible. And for us who speak English, the Holy King James Version of the Bible. It's God's book. And God is big enough to show you all the possibilities. Because he says, whatever you choose, I'll do that. Don't worry about it. Wherever you choose, we can go there. And he's so powerful, he'll put both. It's, it's like an alternate ending in a movie. Some of these movies sometimes, they let the people choose the ending. If you have like a Blu-ray disc or something, it'll say, it'll end this way, but it, you can go and you put alternate ending, and the movie will end a different way. You choose how it ends. It's interesting. The director will make two different endings, and you choose. Yeah, choose, your own adventure books. Choose, your, choose your own adventure books with the children. You can go in this direction, this direction. Well, that Bible's like that. Why? Because God wants you to know. I wrote this down. God put all the possibilities in scripture so that you can know that this is his book. God put both outcomes in the scriptures, like David, so that you might know that the book you have in your hand is not of man's origin, but is the living word of the living God and you can trust it. I've read the Quran so that I can deal with Muslims. None of this stuff is in the Quran. And it's not in any other holy book where they tell the future and tell the different possibilities that could happen. Why I bring that up? Before examining the altar and the cross, we need to point out that both instruments, all right, let's get to this. I use the board a lot. This will help me too, so we can. We got a couple of things. The altar, and I put the altar first because it, it shows up in scripture first, and then the cross. As I was thinking about put, as I was putting this together, both of these instruments, it points to one thing that Jesus must die. Both of these are instruments of death in Scripture. We're going to see that the altar, we saw, we just saw in Leviticus 17, 11, I have given you the blood upon the altar to make atonement for the soul, but it was somebody who died. It was, it was an animal, a, a, a lamb, goat, whatever, but it was an animal. And obviously we know, praise the Lord, that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, died on that cross. So when we, we examine both of these, the fact is it's presupposing that he has to die, okay? And, and you know what? That's in Scripture. I want to show you something. Um, go with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 2. So I'm going to lay out a case like we're in a courtroom that whether it was the altar or whether it's the cross, we haven't gotten there yet, but the fact that the Bible mentions both of these means that Jesus must die. And that wasn't a mystery. It wasn't a mystery that Jesus had to die. Let's look at that. Look what Peter says in Acts chapter 2 as he speaks to Israel. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Acts 2, 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. 
Who is Peter talking to? Israel. Ye men of Israel. Jesus of Nazareth, there's the Messiah. A man approved of God among you, how? By miracles and wonders and signs. That's why he did it, so he could say, Israel, I'm the Messiah. He says, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Now, here's what I want you guys to focus on. Look at verse 23. Him, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, being delivered, how? By the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of who? God. God. Who ultimately was the person that decided that Jesus would come to die? It was God the Father. They had this plan that he would die for Adam's sins before he created Adam. That's because God, is, he, it, look at that. It was the determinate counsel. The Godhead had a counsel and said, you're going to have to die. No, the Lord says, look, Father, the word says, Father, I'll die. The Son says, I'll die for man. That's his love for us. But it was God, notice the foreknowledge. Go with me if you will. To Romans chapter chap Romans chapter eight Romans eight Romans eight one book over. So I, I want to make it clear that mankind wasn't the main reason Jesus died. Yes, they were a part of it. God and man worked together. But make no mistake that before they crucified the Messiah, God the Father had already determined with the rest of the Godhead, the Son and the Holy Ghost, that He would die for man. That's the love. Of God. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Oh, I love this verse. He, this is about God the Father. He that spared not his own what? Son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I could do the whole study on that verse right there, but I won't do it today. But here's what I want you to see. He spared not his own son, but he delivered him up. God delivered his son to man to do what they will with him. And I'm going to tell you that God delivered him up. Not to be, well, I, I don't want to get ahead of us. Just watch where the thing. God delivered him up to be a sacrifice. And all through scripture, God showed them how they should sacrifice him. They didn't do it that way. And God says, I'll still use it. Stay with me. But he delivered them up. Let's keep looking. Go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Go over to Hebrews chapter 10. He, I was telling Debbie at the, at the um, picnic last Sunday, we were talking about Hebrews. Hebrews is written to the Hebrew people. Because you have those verses, if we sin willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. That's not a grace verse. It says, uh, uh, if they tasted of the heavenly gift, they cannot no longer uh, receive uh, repentance, but, but a fearful looking for the judgment of God. That's not a graceful verse. We can't lose our salvation. Amen. That's rightly dividing. But let me show you what it says in Hebrews about the Messiah. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Hebrews 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, now, this is about uh, blood sacrifice of animals. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. Speaking of animals. But a body has thou prepared me. So he says, the Messiah says, you know what, Lord? I'm looking at all these animals. You don't want that. You gave me a body. Look at the next verse. In burnt offerings, verse 6, and sacrifices for sin, thou, ha thou hast had no pleasure. <clears throat> What the scripture says, and that's in Psalms, Psalm 40 as well. Jesus Christ came to in, in, in a human body with human blood so that he might die for man. God says, I'm tired of these animals. I don't want animals. I want a man. Adam is a man. He sinned. I need another Adam to come take his place and die for his sins. And guess what? He got one in Jesus of Nazareth, our Messiah, our Lord. But what I want you to see, this sacrifice and offering, where was that thing taking place? Let me show you that. Go back to Genesis chapter 8, the first time altar is used. Genesis chapter 8, when Noah comes off the ark. I always quiz my little girl, who's eight years old now. How many animals, how many per, how, was it, how many sets of animals did, 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 did 
did uh, Noah take on the ark? It says they went out. They went on two by two, right? <laughs> but we forget sometimes that of the clean animals, he took by sevens. Now we understand why he would take of 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 the unclean animals or the other animals two by two, so they could procreate a male female, right? That's what it said. But why did he take seven of the clean for a sacrifice? Something is about to happen. That this sacrifice now is not going to be on God's altar that he had, like where the cherubim were. But he's going to have Noah, because now with the flood, God is no longer resident on the earth. The Lord lived with man on the earth till Genesis flood. Then he went up. Because when Noah comes off, he's going to sacrifice of these clean animals. That's why he took extra. And the smoke is going to ascend. And so the first time you see the word altar, let's look at it. Look at Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 20. First time altar is used. And Noah built an altar. Now what is an altar to do for? An altar, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's to worship by sacrifice, yes. To worship by blood. I got to put that in there. Sacrifice. Okay. That's what altars in the scripture. To worship by blood sacrifice. Worship God. Now, I just put it generally. We know it's to worship God. But you do know that the pagans, the heathens, they build altars. They sacrifice blood sacrifices. Unborn babies. Uh -huh. In the mother's womb. Uh -huh. Still do. You know what that's all about. You know what abortion is all about. Giving power to darkness. <clears throat> killing the most innocent of the, the, the humanity. Baby still in mother's womb. That is a sacrifice to Satan. Uh -huh. It gives him power through that innocent blood. Innocent blood has power. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ, the most innocent blood, still is saving people to this uh -huh. day. 200,000 a year. Baby. It's the highest death rate of, for any, anything. Mm -hmm. the, safe, the place where a child should be the safest in their mother's belly dangerous. is the most dangerous. Yeah. Thank you, Satan. Thank you, unbelieving man. To worship God. And God gave an altar to man. And notice what it says about this altar that Noah built. Verse 20, and Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the, what? Altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And then the Lord says, I won't curse the ground again for man's sake and so forth. Well, oh, I won't, I won't I bring a flood. You guys know the deal. But here's we, are, what, we are that sweet savor now. We are that sweet savor now, yeah, in the dispensation of grace. The members of the body as living sacrifices, mm -hmm. Romans 12. When well, we get to that, now watch this. Before, before examining the altar of the cross, I wanted you to first see that he must die. <clears throat> Both of these instruments are instruments of death. Okay, we got that. The question is now, in what manner or way was it supposed to happen? Because you have both in view, and we're going to look at that. Keep that in mind. Because while it is true that when it comes to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary, it was always in view. So we're going to look at that. That's going to be the next thing to look at. I'm going to show you that the cross was pictured throughout Scripture. Okay? But does it automatically mean that was the specific way God, the Father, wanted him to die? Well, I'm done now, Doty. <laughs> <We all did. laughs> My student, Doty. That's why they love you, Doty. Go ahead, Doty. I ahead. just read this. I can't tell you where it is uh -huh. right now, but if the princes knew, they wouldn't have sacrificed him. Exactly. There, I read that this we're, we're going in that direction. That's right. That's Debbie, our new sister here. The Lord, we, uh, she's new to our ministry here. Because people are going to say, hey, you heard Debbie. So, so we're on the right path. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to lay out this over the course of the study. But you guys are with me. Don't watch this. So we already went to the first time. Let me show you now that the cross was always in view. Go with me to Exodus chapter 12. This is the exodus of the nation of Israel out of Egypt through Moses. Go to Exodus chapter 12. We've heard of the Passover. And with this Passover, this was something before the law. The law was not given to mankind, to Israel, till Gen uh, uh, Exodus chapter 19 and chapter 20. But before Exodus chapter 19 and verse chapter 20 of the Ten Commandments, 
the Lord's Passover was instituted here in Exodus chapter 12. Now, it's something interesting I want you to see about it. Look at Exodus chapter 12. And let's see here. Let me write down my verse. But yeah, here we go. Verse 3. Thank you, Dick. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to him, uh, unto his house, take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your account for the land. We were talking about this last week at our own uh, uh, picnic with the food and fellowship. Uh, people think about the uh, Last Supper, like the Catholicism and Baal worship. It's, it's a little wafer and wine. They had an entire meal. It was a Passover meal. They ate, by the way, the first thing in Passover, get a, big lamb, get a lamb. If it's too big for you, share it with your neighbor. They were eating lamb and everything. But here's what I want you to see. Um, down to where, where he puts it on, on, on the verse, down to verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, draw out and take your lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall, this is what I want you to see. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, that plant, dip it in the blood and it is, it, that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the, uh, uh, at the door of his house until the morning. And then he goes on to say the Lord is going to pass over, right? So God sends the death angel to pass over the house. But notice where they put it. The lintel. And the two posts. Now let me show you what blood would do. If you got a bunch of blood and you put it up there, that blood's going to drip down. Right? And you got two sides over here where there's sections for blood. And if you connect those, there's a picture of the cross right there. Because the blood there and then the blood here. And it would come down here and the blood would be all over here. The blood, the blood, the blood. And he says, don't get out of that blood. That blood was going to protect them as the death angel coming. But what you have in view is the cross there. But that was way back in Exodus. Let me show you something as we go through. Go to Psalm 22. I mean, it's just clear in Psalm 22. Go to Psalm 22. The cross was always in view. Look at Psalm chapter 22 and verse 16. Psalm 22, verse 16. This is a messianic psalm forecasting when the Lord Jesus Christ is on the cross. How do we know? Well, here it is. Psalm 22, 16. For dogs, that's the, the Gentiles, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked, that's the, 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 the evil rulers of Israel, have enclosed me. And what did those Roman Gentile heathen dogs and those wicked assembly of the religious leaders of Israel do? It says, they pierced my what? Hands and my feet. That is definitely an allusion to the cross of Christ. They pierced his hands and his feet. But wait, there's more. Go over to Zechariah. Zechariah, one of the minor prophets there towards the end of the Old Testament. Go to Zechariah chapter number 12. It's clear from Scripture, it's clear from Scripture that the cross was always in view. So I want to make no mistake about it, and we thank God for that cross. That's where our Lord died for our sins. And we're going to be eternally, listen, we're going to see the, the, the marks of Calvary. I'm going to show you in this verse, well, I'm going to show you in this verse. When he rose from the dead, he told Thomas, behold my hands and my feet. You guys remember that? Thomas says, I won't believe that he rose from the dead until I take my finger and put it right in the nail prints and stick it right inside where the soldier did. And he says, he showed himself. He still has those marks from Calvary in his glorious body. Isn't that beautiful? Because all throughout eternity, when we look at the Lord Jesus, we're going to see Calvary. We're going to see his handprints. Look at, look at chapter 12. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ to the earth. Uh, Zechariah 12, verse 10. Zechariah 12, 10. And I will pour upon, upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem 
The spirit of grace and supplications. They got a glimpse of that at Acts 2 with the spirit of God poured out. <clears throat> and they shall look upon me who they shall look upon me whom they have what? Pierced. Pierced. And they shall mourn for him. So the Lord is saying it about the Messiah. Interesting. They're going to look upon me whom they pierced. They should mourn for him. There's the God, man, Messiah. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns in his second coming to set up his kingdom on the earth, the people of Israel are going to see him and say, Who did this to you? And he says, I was in the house of my friends. They pierced me. They're going to say, This was real. You were really crucified. Yeah. So the cross is in view. It's in scripture. They pierced him. One more. Go over to, well, a couple more. Look at John chapter 19. Go to the Gospel of John chapter 19. I just want to get on record all these verses about the crucifixion. Look at John chapter 19, verse 34. John 19, verse 34. <clears throat> Back, verse 33, to get the uh, context. John 19, 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his leg. All this nonsense that lost people bring up about swooning, and really he was just weak on the cross, and the, at night the, 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 the temp cool temperatures got him back there. It's all nonsense. They, they, they took him off before all of that stuff. He was dead. A Roman soldier, well, look at the rest of the verse. Verse 34, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water, and he that saw it bear record, John was there, and his record is true, and that and he knoweth that he saith true. He knoweth that he saith true, that ye might what? Believe. Believe. Verse 37. Look, go down to verse 37. And again another scripture. They shall look upon him whom they have what? Pierced. Pierced. The immediate, the immediate one there in Zechariah is right at the cross. They were looking upon him whom they pierced. So that was the cross. So it is no doubt that the Holy Scriptures prophesied about Jesus' death on the cross. It was already in view. Well, what about the altar? Let's look at that. Again, even though it was prophesied, is that the specific way that God <coughs> wanted him to die? What we're going to see is that God always intended for Israel to sacrifice their Messiah by faith. What does the Bible say? How does faith come? Faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing, hearing by word. Faith is taking God at his word. Mm -hmm. But did God tell Israel to reject my son? Put him on a cruel and criminal Roman cross, and I'll be pleased with that. We didn't see this, but if we go back to Acts 2.23, where Peter says, uh, the, the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, later he says, and by wicked hands, wicked hands, ye slew him. And although our apostle Paul, he says, rejoice in the preaching of the cross, under God's grace, what we're going to see that in prophecy, God was not pleased that they rejected his son, kicked him out of the city, and put him in the hands of these, 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 the, these Romans, these Gentile dogs, and put him on that cruel and criminal cross as a curse. Curses everyone hanging on a tree. What I'm going to show you today, that the way that God intended for Israel to kill their Messiah, they were going to have to slay him. He had to die. It wasn't on a cruel and criminal cross, although God used it for his glory. Praise the Lord. Amen. It was supposed to be on an altar mm -hmm. in the temple. Mm -hmm. On an altar the same way God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Go with me to Genesis 22. Let me show you that. Go to Genesis 22. You see it right from the beginning. Abraham, the most faithful man in scripture. Even to this day, people say the Abrahamic faith, Islam. Judaism, Christendom. Abraham, God said, I'll make your name great. The, the greatest man's name on earth today. I say today because it's, it's going to be Jesus one day. The man who was held in the highest esteem 
amongst billions of people on this earth is Abraham. Abraham has the greatest name respect on earth. And guess who said they were going to do that? God did. God did. And to this day, June 11, 2017, right here in California, Abraham, his name is the greatest name on earth until the Lord. Okay? The most respected. Because God said it. Now I want to show you something. Look at Genesis chapter 22, if you will. You ever remember what God told Abraham to do? Look at chapter 22, verse 1. And it came to pass that after these things that God did tempt, that's try or test Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he says, Behold, here am I. Now I want everybody to pay attention to what God told him to do. God told him to do it. He said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. God didn't even think about Ishmael. He wasn't the promised son, Isaac. Whom thou lovest. The first time love is mentioned in the Bible, this verse. Now, your mind as a Bible student, I hope it's thinking, hmm, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Take now thy son, thine only son, that thou lovest, Abraham. Abraham is a type of God the Father, and he's about to do something to show his love for God. Watch this. Verse 2, and he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, not Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee. Well, why in the world would God tell him to do that? It's a type and shadow of what God the Father is going to do with his own son. He's going to offer him right on Mount Moriah, right over there. Now, I want you to see this. You can read all the, 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 uh, you can read all the, 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 the stuff yourself, but I want you to see at the end here, verse 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, son, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, now watch this, everybody. He's going to prophesy. God, not, not, he's not going to say God will provide for himself. God will provide himself a what? Lamb. A lamb for a burnt offering. So they went together, both of them. They went both of them together. And what Abraham does, if you go down, he takes it to this stone and he puts the, check this out, he puts the wood in place. And what he's about to do is sacrifice Isaac on an altar. Of wood. Interesting. Did you know that the altar in the temple was wood overlaid with pure gold? That's right. Mm -hmm. See, God had all of this in mind. But I do want you to see that Abraham himself was told by God to have a sacrifice of a person. Now, God didn't let him do it. He stopped. He says, I know that you'll do it. And when he saw that, he was able to bless Abraham, James chapter 2. But I want you to see that what God is looking for when he had Abraham do that, sacrifice his son on the altar, that God was looking forward to the time where Israel, the people of Abraham, would do the same thing. Now, with the time we have left, about 15 minutes, I want to show you all this. I, I like to show you the verses. With God, motivation matters. God Amen. wanted Israel to kill the Messiah because he needed to shed his blood for them. God did not desire that no. but he accepted that I'm going to show you that as we end in Philippians 3 Chris and I were talking about this years ago so keep that in mind I'm going to show you that this altar was what he was looking for go with me if you will to Exodus chapter we're in Genesis go to Exodus chapter 20 Exodus 20 and by the way I can't even go in every verse about the altar the whole Levitical priesthood was based on sacrifices on an altar that, that was their whole thing, the whole book of Leviticus. Look at Exodus chapter, what did I tell you, 24? I'm uh, sorry, Exodus chapter 20, verse 24. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, God says to Israel. By the way, this is the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. Watch this. 
and shalt sacrifice thereon thy what? Burnt offering. That tells you that when Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac for a burnt offering, he's made an altar of earth and he put the wood there. My point is, every time God wants a sacrifice, he says, do it on an altar. Whether it's Noah, whether it's Abraham, Moses, all the priests, an altar, an altar, an altar. Keep going. All wood. All, altar of wood, that's right. Go over to Deuteronomy. Go over to the fifth book, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12, look at verse 27. Deuteronomy 12, verse 27. Uh-oh, here we go. Y'all sitting down? All right, here we go. And Deuteronomy 12, 27. And thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, the flesh and the what? The blood. Why did the Lord Jesus say in the Gospel of John, if any man eat not my flesh and drink not my blood, there's no way he could have life. Because on that altar, you would offer the flesh and the blood upon the altar of the, of the Lord thy God. And the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out upon the altar of the Lord thy God, and thou shalt eat the flesh. John 6, 53, the Lord Jesus says, unless a man eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's talking about that sacrifice he's going to be. That's from here. Let's keep going. I just want to get, we're going to get them on record. Um, oh, I like this one. Go to Matthew chapter 8. Yeah, go to Matthew chapter 8. Go all the way to the New Testament there, Matthew chapter 8. You ever notice why this happened? In Matthew chapter 8, look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 4. I'll get a little sip here, Matthew 8 verse 4. The Lord Jesus Christ, he cleanses these lepers or a leper. You ever notice why he said what he's going to say right here? You ever think about this? Look at verse 4. And Matthew 8, verse 4. And Jesus said unto him, this leper, See thou tell no man, but go thy way. Show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. You ever wonder why he told him, hey, don't, 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 don't stop nowhere, go tell the priest. Why did he tell the, the leper to go right to the priest and say, I'm healed. I'm going to offer this. They're going to say, who, who, was, who, who did God give the power to heal the lepers in Israel? The priest. And the priest would say, we're, we're, we're the ones supposed to do that. Who did that? Jesus did, the Messiah. And what the priest should have done is says, the Messiah. We needed to go down there, bow down, you're the Messiah. Come on, come on, Messiah. On that, on that Passover, we're going to sacrifice you. Well, we know they didn't do that. And Almighty God, who knows all the possibilities and alternatives, put both of them in Scripture. Just so you can know God's book. Amen. It didn't catch him off guard. Altar, altar, altar. Where does cross thing come from? God says, I got that in here too, if you look under the surface. It's both there. But notice here, that's why he says, go as a testimony unto them. Look at the end of verse 4. For a testimony unto them. That's to the priest. The priest should have saw this and said, who did this? Only God can do this. Uh, God did it. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus, the Son of God. Let's keep going. Look at Matthew 26, verse 30. Matthew 26 and verse 30. This is the Last Supper. They had a Passover meal before, the day before the Passover. What would be the reason they held a Passover meal, the Lord and his 12 apostles, why would they hold a Passover meal the day before Passover? Why did they hold their Passover meal, the Last Supper, the day before the Passover? He was going to be doing because he was going to go and die on Passover. So because he wouldn't be with them on Passover, you know, he'll be the actual Passover lamb. He says we need to have our meal now because tomorrow I'm going to actually be the Passover. That's what he was doing. Watch this. As, as they're finishing up their meal, notice what happens before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 30. And when they had sung an hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. 
And then Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. Here comes his passion. Now why does it say they sang a hymn? You ever wonder what hymn that would have been? A hymn is a solemn song. James says, if any man is merry among you, let him sing psalms. But a hymn is one of solemnity, one of mourning. I think I know what hymn they say. Go back to Psalm 118. Now, actually, of the psalms, there are some psalms of rejoicing, psalms, uh, messianic psalms of, of, uh, of uh, sadness and so forth. Go back to Psalm chapter 118. Psalm chapter 118. Psalm 118. Psalm 118 and verse 21. This was the last time Jesus came into Jerusalem. Anybody remember what happened when he came into Jerusalem? What did the people say? Well, first of all, what did they do? Yeah, they got palm branches. You know what we get Palm Sunday, all that Catholic stuff? Because the people of Israel took palm branches, and as the Lord Jesus Christ was on a coat, the foal of an ass, Hosanna. they said, Hosanna, that's exactly right. They put palm trees down, and they're going to fulfill this psalm. Watch this. Psalm 118, verse number, what did I tell you? 20. Yeah, 21. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused, that's the Messiah, it's become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Oh, I love this, boy. You go into the average black Pentecostal church I've been a part of. They start off, this is the day of which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, yeah. But that, that had nothing to do with that. that. This is Israel. Listen. Verse 24. This is the day. This is the day of their salvation. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We, that's Israel, will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. And what did the people say in verse 26? Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. What's the house of the Lord there? Temple. The temple. Yeah. Keep reading. Uh, Debbie mentioned this earlier. I said we get to this. Look at this, Debbie. God is the Lord, which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the what? Uh huh. This is what they were singing. The priest, as he comes in Jerusalem, hey, he showed himself for four days. The Passover lamb, you were supposed to watch this little lamb for four days. So for four days, he kept coming to the temple right before the Passover. And they were disposed to see if there was any blemish in the little lamb. And he says, which are you convincing me to sin? He was presenting himself to the priest saying, check me out. See if there's any blemish in me. He's doing the Passover. And what they should have said is, this is the Messiah. Bind the Messiah with cords even into the horns of the altar. Look at the next verse. How it ends. Huh? Thou art my God. I will praise thee, thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endure forever. This is the prayer of the nation of Israel. They had the Messiah, they had the sacrifice. They sh the priest should have said, this is the Messiah. Dear, they should have bowed down and just in wet wept and says, come Lord. And he would have said, let's go. Let's do what I was destined to do. Bind me to this. And they would have done what Moses taught them to do every day for 1,500 years. They were practicing through all of these Levitical sacrifices in the temple what they ultimately should have done to the Messiah. But did they do that? No. no. As we end, this is the hardest part of this. Because God taught them what to do through their father Abraham, through their prophet Moses the man of God, through all the Levitical priests over 1,500 years, when the Messiah shows up, believe on him, take him, take him in that temple, and on that Passover, you sacrifice the Messiah. But they didn't. The day of that Passover, you know what they did? They called the Romans over. We don't want them. Go over to Hebrews. It, it hurts my heart. Hebrews chapter 12. 
But oh, before we end, don't, don't get too sad. Because although they didn't obey God and sacrifice him on the altar and put him on a cruel criminal cross, God still used that cross. Because God is gracious and merciful. He says, you know what? Nonetheless, his blood was shed and I'm going to use it. It's not the way I want, but I'm going to use it. Israel, I'm going to set you aside, but I'm going to use it. You Gentiles did that, but I'm going to bless you through the dispensation of grace, through that same blood. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. <clears throat> Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, says the writer of Hebrews, who for the joy that was set before him endured the what? He didn't die as a conquering hero on the cross, I'm see, on, on the temple uh, altar. He died in rejection. Look, he endured the cross despising the what? The cross represents shame, rejection. You said it, Dodie, say it. Cursed is anyone that hangeth on a tree. A curse. That's what that pointed to, the cross. These, this altar would have been one of rejoicing. They, did, you, did we read the song? Re, re, read that Psalm 118 again because that thing is like, hey, we bless, bless you out loud. They're, they're rejoicing. They're like, come on, Lord, bring, give it to them. That's not the cross. But they didn't do it by faith. They did it in unbelief. In unbelief. Oh, man. We got to end, but give me two minutes. But you know what? Go to Philippians chapter 2. Go back to Philippians. Chris and I were talking about this years ago. And she said, why would he say it like this? He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Why, why did Paul put it like that? Because Jesus Christ was going to be obedient unto death anyway. That, one was, that was the way he was supposed to die. He could have said, time out, Lord, time out. You ever play with children a game and you beat them, you beat them bad? They said, time out. We're going to change the rules. He could have said, wait a minute, Lord. Our plan was that they would sacrifice me on the altar by faith. That was the plan. But, Father, they didn't choose to do that. No. Son, will you, will you still do it? Well, yes, Lord. Drop, the blood drops. Because he was thinking, don't even mention the blood drops. He was thinking about, he's going to be separated from the Father. But it's not going to be in that glorious, right. as Messiah there, glory, one of glory, from, from man's perspective. It, God's going to get the glory. We're going to get the glory. But because of his grace, but he was dying one of rejection shame. and shame and curse. Right. Now look what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto what? Yeah. But he, he was going to die anyway. But what wasn't he was supposed to die? Even the death of the cross. That was one of uh, shame, rejection, and curse it. Christ became a curse for us, Paul says, Galatians 3. And because of that, look what God did. Verse 9. Wherefore God also, in, in, in response to what the Lord Jesus Christ did, dying a death that he shouldn't have died. That wasn't part of the deal. It wasn't glorious on the altar in the temple. It was on some cruel and criminal Roman cross as a curse. But because of that sacrifice, everybody, notice, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of who? God the Father. Two verses as we end. I want you to get them and then we'll look at them. Get Acts chapter... Nah, that's okay. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says that God, through, the, through, through his own blood, she shed. Get these two passages. Get Colossians 1 and Romans 3. Let's end there. I got, I, this, this goes to the, the crux of the gospel of grace. Get Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians 1. And then Romans 3. We're going to look at Colossians 1 and then end in Romans 3, okay? Thank you for your patience. Colossians 1. 
in Romans 3. Remember earlier I mentioned the NIV and, and many other versions? Why in the world would they not leave the blood in the verse? Look at Colossians 1.14. Colossians 1.14. In whom we have redemption. How? Through his blood. There's power in the blood, as the song says, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, why would the NIV and other versions take out the blood? Because there's power in Because the there's power in that blood, and Satan don't want you to have the power of his blood. Let's end in Romans chapter 3. The innocent blood of Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, he was supposed to die on the altar in the temple. He ended up dying on a cruel and criminal Roman cross. But his, you know what didn't change? His innocent blood. The innocent blood of Jesus was shed nonetheless. And God in his magnificent wisdom was able to use the cross. Even though what it symbolized to Israel was shame and rejection. He was able to take that and use that to save us today. We were talking with Debbie last week about the difference between the New Covenant and the New Testament. God never made a covenant with, nation, with, with, with the nations, the Gentiles. He made all the covenants with Israel to whom pertain the covenants. But Paul does mention the New Testament. And with, there's, the testament is not enforced after the death of the testator. When Jesus died on that cross, God took the value of that blood and applied it to the Gentiles. Let me show you that as we end. Verse number 21, Romans 3. But now, the righteousness of God, how? Without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even, what did that even mean? That is, even the righteousness of God, which is how? By faith of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you this. The only version of the Bible that uses the faith of Christ, not even the new King James, is the King James. Because it's his faithfulness that's the issue, not ours. Amen. And when they change even something like faith of Jesus Christ, the faith in Jesus Christ, they're taking the focus off of him. Right. They seek nothing but to cast him down from his excellency. That, it might seem like a little thing, but it's huge. It huge. It's the faith of Jesus Christ, what he did. It's unto all and upon all them that what? Believe. There's our faith. Yeah. For there is no difference for all of sin, Jew and Gentile, and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, why did he call him Jesus Christ in verse 22 and Christ Jesus in verse 24? Be well, Christ comes because the suffering is the focus there. Right. Suffering and glory. The man Jesus... It was Christ. He suffered. That's why he puts it switched. We got to end right here in verse number 25. Whom God had set forth to be a propitiation. How? Through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, that's Paul, at this time, this dispensation of grace, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believed in Jesus. Here's the point. It is through the blood of the cross that God in his graciousness and mercy can now save a person. That's why it's not incumbent upon your works today. It's all about what he did on the cross. Let me, let me say it like this. Our Lord Jesus should have died a conqueror's hero's death. Israel should have put the Messiah, bind him with cords to the horns of that altar in that temple, and praise the Lord for raising him up from the dead, just like Abraham. We didn't read this, Genesis 22. Third day, Abraham did that. Jesus would have been dead three days and then rose from the dead. He still did that. But he was so willing to die for us that instead of dying as a concrete hero, he died as a cruel and criminal, cruel criminal, even though he wasn't. That's how much he loved us. Now, what does he ask mankind to do to show love back to him? One thing today, trust him, believe on him. If you're not saved, you haven't put your faith and trust in the, in the, the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Understand what you're throwing away. Everlasting life is a free gift. You're going to have an eternity in hell and lake of fire. He doesn't want you to do that. That's why he was willing to die, not just on an altar, but on the cross. And if you're saved today, oh my. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for his all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The, 
that we which live should not henceforth not live unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and rose again. If you're saved, do you not hear what the Bible is saying? Look what he did for you. All he's asking is that we give ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's what we're all about. We can be a part of this assembly, even by, by far. We can do this. The Lord is coming soon. His day is at hand, Paul says. Let's not waste the time we have, okay? If you're not saved, trust the Lord Jesus. He died for you. He'll save you this moment. And if you are saved, get busy with the work of ministry. That's why we have a ministry. We all sacrificing to do the work of the Lord in the little bitty time we have left to redeem. The Lord is at hand. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life being, shed, uh, being, 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 being given, his life, his, his, his shed blood on Calvary's cross, his, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And he gave of his blood, Father, his life. Not because he did anything wrong, but he did it for us. We thank you, dear Lord. We thank you, Heavenly Father and Holy Spirit. We thank the Godhead for coming up with this wonderful plan of redemption by your grace today. We know that when this dispensation of grace ends, you must fulfill your plan and purpose with the nation of Israel and the earth, which includes the wrath, the time of Jacob's trouble, and the worst time period to ever hit this earth. We thank you for delivering us from the wrath to come, for taking us into your heavenly kingdom, Father, we want to be ready for your judgment seat of Christ that we all going to stand before. So may we redeem this time so that we might receive the reward of the inheritance for serving the Lord Christ. May we be not like our brethren and sisters who serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own bellies. Father, I pray for these saints. I thank you for these saints here in person and for our brothers and sisters who, because of distance and so forth, can't be with us, but they're with us in spirit. I know it's not the best, Father, because we need to have the live dynamic of fellowship to be the best we can be. But Father, I ask that your wonderful grace and mercy extends to them because of their love and prayer and support of this ministry as well. We know the time is short. We look forward to the Lord's return. But until then, Father, we're thankful that we have each other, have your holy word, and that each week you encourage us as we meet together with those of like precious faith. We thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Oh! <laughs> I always catch you on guard. Oh, man. Thank you, guys. Well, I have a quick question, and then I have to leave. I know you do. Go ahead, Dougie. What was kept hidden? The fact that because of the cross, God would reconcile the heavenly okay. places, the heavens. Okay. Satan, he, he now has a foothold in both heaven and earth. Right. He knew from prophecy that the earth would be reclaimed by the Messiah. Right? If the Messiah was, that's what he was trying to tempt Jesus. He was saying, hey man, I'll give you all this. Don't, don't do all this worshiping God. I'll give it to you. But who still would have been the one in charge? Satan. Yeah. Jesus would have been the vice regent. But God promised that the Messiah would be king over all the earth, right? King of kings. Right. But he had to go through suffering right. and death first. So what, what, what Satan was trying to do was to get him to bypass the suffering and death, which if you make a deal with the devil, you always know. But the point is, he was trying to tempt him to bypass all that serving God to be king on earth. The mystery was that God would reconcile the heavens through the blood of Jesus Christ as well. Amen. That's Amen. why he says, if, if the, if none, which none of the princes of this world knew, for Corinthians 2, mm -hmm. had, the, had Satan known that he would have not, had Satan known that through the cross of Christ, God would get the heavens back, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would have just let him be. Because the heavens do rule. Right? The heavens do rule. Right, and then that would continue his rule. It would, it would have squashed the, the fact that he'd run the earth. earth but, yeah. but since he's reigning now, yeah. he's yeah. kings and of lords and kings in the heavenly places, Lord, which yeah. is us in the heavenly places, as well as men on the earth and Israel, which says they will be like gods. Mm -hmm. They will be rulers, like kings and lords. And, and, and Dodie, when we talk about the mystery, it's in subsections. Mm -hmm. Another mystery, part of the mystery is that God would save Gentiles, not through Israel's rise, but through their fall. Through that was fall. a mystery. That, that's not in the Old well, Testament. All along he's been talking about the earth and the kingdom. Right. Correct. And in Genesis 1, it said he created the heavens and mm -hmm. the earth. What's the first verse of the Bible? That sets the tone. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and right. the earth. And from Genesis 1, 2, right, mm -hmm. he focused on and the what? The earth. 
Right. And the entire focus from Genesis 1 to Acts 9 that's is right. how God's going to reclaim the earth. Right. What, what was a mystery, secret. that's the secret. That's the secret. That's the secret. Yes. That's right. the By the way, through, through the seed of Abraham, the Hebrews, right. what, we do, what we don't know from Scripture is that God would take people who are not Hebrews, Gentiles, right. and place them in a heavenly, a heavenly kingdom. Yes. That was a mystery. Wow. And in the heavenly rulership. In the rulership of not just in the kingdom, because yes. all, all the heirs of God. Just like Israel. But the joint heirs are going to be heirs of God. Uh, right. Joint heirs are going to reign Why with Christ. Why isn't it being taught? Because Satan, unbelief, and pride. Yeah, that's right. He's so powerful that God is all powerful. Because, Dodi, you're not going to become a famous preacher if you're preaching the truth. You have to let the truth go, and then you become more, you know. It's the same reason why the uh, path to salvation is narrow. Because, it's very uh, narrow. Yeah, you know, yep. free will. Man's free will is what yeah. it comes down to. And it's the same reason the, the outcome of why these people don't believe is because they are not students of the Word of God. Exactly. They are believers mm -hmm. in Christ and Jesus, so, yeah. and they believe the words, but they are not students Yeah, they could be saved. The they could be saved and just... Yep. Yeah, they're, they haven't come into knowledge of the truth. Yeah, yeah that's right. Look at those truth governors, they only want so much truth, and they're mm -hmm. happy with it. And because with truth comes suffering. And whether it's suffering like as a minister, and you don't have the human resources to get the stuff done. See, what you, you have want, is in the yeah. Gospels, you have Jesus taking on all the sufferings. Yeah, totally. And then, yeah. you know, the Jews, they didn't really suffer too much while he was taking all the sufferings, right? But in our dispensation, we take on the sufferings of Christ. That's right. So that's the thing they want to reject and, and rebuke because they don't right. want to go through those sufferings. Right. But they just want to have all the glorious things that the Lord gave to Israel right. in that program. That's why they follow Jesus and they don't follow Paul and the dispensation of grace. Right. Oh, yeah. that way he said, let this mind be in you. And Philippians too, yeah. And, and growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. You develop the mind of Christ. You yeah. develop the mind of Christ, and mm -hmm. the mystery is known to you that Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. Correct. Yes, right. That's Philippians and Colossians. Mm -hmm. and that's the process of edification, uh, Sister Debbie. That That's what we do each each day, but each week, especially together, we're, we're, we're in a process of edification and, and growing. And Go ahead, How many Lord. people really realize that Christ is in us? His spirit is in us well, daily. Yeah. Well, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of God in, in a believer. Right. But but the issue of Christ in you, remember this, though. I just want to say this to everybody. Mm -hmm. Dodie's right. First Corinthians chapter 6, the Holy Ghost, God the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. he's a gift given to each and every individual believer, First Corinthians right. chapter 6, right. okay? Mm -hmm. But this issue of Christ, mm -hmm. the focus, as you know, Dodie, has to do with suffering with him, right? Mm -hmm. right. Suffering in the truth. Right. That's why Paul says, okay, so for example, Christ in, in, you, in you. Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right, it's the hope of glory. But this issue of Christ or the spirit of Christ, Romans right. 8 9, that that's something that's part of your, that's part of your sanctification, okay? Right. Right. Because what did Paul say in Galatians 4? Oh, he talks about Galatians, he says, my little children, right. they were babies, in whom I travail in birth again, till Christ be formed in you. Mm -hmm. Here's the point. It's not automatic. This is a sanctification verse. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, sanctification. I agree with that. Okay. So I just want to make sure that everybody know this one is a positional thing. The moment you get saved, you have the life of God. You do. You spirit, yes. spirit, Holy Ghost. But what God is looking for is to build Christ in you. That's the sanctification. Yes. Looking for faithful men. In faithful men, and that comes in the mystery. You're growing in the mystery. Yeah. And that's also one is positional. Right. One is one is position. One is practice. Mm -hmm. One is salvation. One uh, justification, sanctification. They're also by faith. You have to believe. They both by faith. Oh, yeah. Right? You yes. heard we talk about your the the, the the first faith. Right. Right. And the second faith. Right. Go over to Romans chapter five. Don't you know this verse? But that will show Debbie and some of the others. And the faith of Christ in between the two, right? Exactly. So so here's. The, this is you, the, mm -hmm. this is the, you, okay, when I say you, the person. Mm -hmm. What connects these two things, the power source, is the faith of mm -hmm. Christ. It's the difference between by faith and through faith. So this is your salvation slash justification. Salvation of your soul. This is your salvation, this is your sanctification slash um, practice. Practice, thank you. So here's my point. In between there, when you first trust Christ as your Savior, now you have to get the 
faith of Jesus Christ in you, which is you do that by faith. We walk by faith. And I wanted to say that, ahead, ahead, that practice can be maybe more fine tunedly described as running the race. Yes. yes. Right. Or the yeah. walk of the believer. Or the walk. Wait, well, you know what? Yeah. You got to walk before you can run. That's true. You have to walk as a right? child, and then you run as a son and daughter.